if there's one guy on this Washington Nationals roster that cannot wait for August to be over, that is our all-star, Josiah Gray. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Swing for the fences on Sleeper picks and you could win up to 100 times your money. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. And thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever. You get your podcast. You can also catch up on the show page on Twitter at LO underscore Nationals and as well as my personal page at Ryan Clary 11 for all your latest Nats news and notes. And speaking of news and notes, I got some news and notes on yesterday's game as Josiah Gray did not look good. But later on in today's show, it's a Mackenzie Gore day. Can we bounce back against this team as this Nationals team has now lost two straight games? We're not used to this losing stuff anymore here in Washington, D.C. We'll preview that series and this game tonight a little bit later on as our ace, Mackenzie Gore, will be taking the mound. Also, it's time to do a little minor league scouting as we all know the name DJ Hers by now, who was acquired as long as well with Kevin Madej with the Chicago Cubs. DJ Hers has been by far and away the best pitcher in the national system over the last month or so. We'll talk about that and as well as Dylan Cruz and how he has really struggled so far at the AA level. We'll talk about that later on. But of course, yesterday's win, or loss rather, I'm I'm used to saying wins now. I truly am. I mean, this team, we come in, we gloat about how good and how much better this team is. And if you remember, there's this one Mets fan troll out there. I won't say the name. I won't say where he's from. Chris Flemmer, I believe. I said the name. He wrote a story today about how he was absolutely wrong about the Washington Nationals and really just kind of trolling us back in March and April saying that this is the most obvious 100 loss team ever. It was nice to see him kind of pull those ropes back in together and all of a sudden he's on the train. So wanted to get that, that out of the way as I thought that was pretty damn funny. But last night's loss, Josiah Gray did not have it. And this has kind of been the normal over the last few starts with Josiah Gray. Now, while you talk about what he does best, over the last few years, Josiah Gray has kind of always been able to swim. You've never really found moments and really over a course of a month, you haven't really been able to see just a bunch of bad starts. And over the month of August, it's been one of his worst starts in quite some time. Definitely since last year, we haven't really seen this kind of Josiah Gray all season long. So, There's a lot of different things to just uncover with this. And first and foremost, the real issue that is coming with Josiah Gray, from what I have seen at least, is that he is simply not commanding the zone. Josiah Gray, he goes out there, and what he has done pretty well over the year, and really then hasn't really taken that much of a step up from last season, but Josiah Gray has been able to pinpoint on his command. He's been a lot better this season in getting his pitches where he wants them to be. Over last year, you kind of saw that differentiate a lot, especially with his fastball. And his fastball over the last month or so, that has also been one of his main struggles. This is not something new with Josiah. Even over this season, he was your all-star. He deserved to be an all-star. He was a very good pitcher in the first half. But you're starting to see his command come off just a little bit. So there's multiple different ideas of what should happen. But let's take a look at the numbers here real quick. As over August, I mean... Yesterday, he only lasted two innings pitch. This was his worst start of the year by far, in my opinion. He gave up four hits in those two innings. He walked four batters, and he only struck out two batters. And now, he officially has an ERA over a four, which is at a 4.05 right now. But in yesterday's ball game, in two innings, had 63 pitches and 36 strikes. From June to July, in those 10 starts from, again, June and July, He went five plus innings and only had 
one start this month of going five plus innings. I think the time to kind of not shut down Josiah Gray, I don't think that's a very good thing. I don't think it's really neutral for a player to just be shut down. Josiah Gray is still going to add value to this team going forward, even over the next month or so. And if this team was a postseason team, you would never even think about shutting down Josiah Gray. What I think the Nationals should do is they should probably skip a start with him because we do know someone who had his start skipped. And that was Jake Irvin. What has he done since? Well, he's looked so much better now. Is that one start that he just skipped, is that going to fix all these issues with Josiah? Probably not. But it'll also give him an opportunity to rest. And I think that is important in this because Josiah Gray's never been hurt. Josiah Gray with the Nationals has been healthy. He's like Patrick Corbin. He takes the ball every five days, and there's no questions about it. But I think it wouldn't hurt to skip one start from him just to see what it's like, especially as you're ramping down towards the end of the season. Yes, we are sort of in a wild card race. You're seven, eight games back from it. But also, the future is still the first priority. And Josiah Gray is a mainstay of that future. He has to stay healthy at all costs. And if you think, which I don't, there's nothing to think that the reason why he's been bad over the last month is due to injury. There is nothing to think when it comes to that. But if, it, if you think that he just needs that one start off, I think it's worth it. You did it with Jay Gervin, and so far it's kind of fixed his issues. If you get him back in the lab a little bit, take a look at the analytics, take a look at all these different things, and really pinpoint what has gone wrong for him, whether it be mechanics thing, whether it be just simply not hitting his targets, which I think that's probably just what it is. I think that's doable for this team. We can afford to have one start off with Josiah Gray because as long as you keep on going with him, as long as you keep on throwing him out there every five game after every five, six days, and you're going to have the same results, when does that not become worth it? Because in my opinion, I want Josiah to go out there and finish off strong. If he's not going to finish off strong, skip a start. You have to try something at this point. Just because from what we have seen over the last month, It has not been the same Josiah Gray as we saw in June and early on in July, and as well as May, for that matter of fact. Josiah Gray, even considering opening day, yesterday was his worst start. It just was. Not even going through three innings is a rarity for Josiah. We've never really seen that from him, at least since his first year with us. Last year, he had some blusters as well, but even then, it was never as bad as yesterday, in my opinion. He could not find his command for yet again, which last game, if you remember, while he did have a good stat line against the Yankees, a lot of that was due to luck. A lot of hard hit balls were off him. And in that game as well, he threw more balls than strikes. Yeah, he may have only gave up one hit at Yankee Stadium, but also you guys saw that game as well. It wasn't the same Josiah Gray. And it really hasn't been that same old Josiah, the all-star version that we've seen from him this year. It has been that way for a while. So at this moment in time, I think, is there a fix? Maybe. And that maybe fix would probably be giving him an off day, skipping one of his starts, having an opener or whatever it may be, having Corey Abbott come back up. And I know I don't want to see that, but have him come back up and make a start. Or maybe Jackson Rutledge comes up as a September call-up and you have him start in Josiah Gray's place and then option back down, depending on what he does. Because that honestly feels like a viable option at this moment. You want to make sure that Josiah Gray is first and foremost healthy entering the 2023 offseason. And number two, you want to end it on a high note. He's had way too good of a year to have him go out there and get rocked around every five to six days at this moment. It's just too much. There's too much pressure on him at this moment. And you just got to take some of it off his plate at this moment, especially the way that this ball club's playing. You want to win. It's as simple as that. And Josiah Gray at this moment just hasn't really done that up to this point. But other highlights from yesterday's game, C.J. Abrams had his first three-plus hit game since August 6th versus Cincinnati. Now, that is about three to four weeks away from what he has done. And just not Josiah, C.J. Abrams, he's kind of been on a little bit of a slow stretch here over the last few weeks here. But seeing that yesterday, 
going up against Kevin Gosman, one of the one probably their best pitcher in the staff outside of Barrios, who's going on the mound today. That's a really encouraging sign as well, just from someone who has struggled a little bit here over the last few weeks. And these two guys, CJ Abrams, Josiah Gray, they've been some of the main culprits as to why this Nationals team has really just kind of gone above their expectations heading into this season. No one should be concerned. C.J. Abrams had himself a day. Josiah Gray had himself another rough day, but it's not the end of the world. This is going to happen over the course of a 162-game season. It's going to happen to any pitcher out there who stays healthy through the duration of a season. I'm not too concerned with Josiah Gray at this moment in time, and I'm definitely not concerned with C.J. Abrams after what I saw yesterday. But on the other hand, the future is the priority. And I say that a lot, and it's repetitive, but it is absolutely true. This team is not meant to win in 2023. Your eyes are still on 2024 and having those two guys being good to end this season and as well as just being healthy, that is your main goal for the next month or so. Thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen every day. The Nationals play the Blue Jays today at 7.07 Eastern time. And it's kind of weird. They start at 7.07 Eastern time. And first and foremost, it's never a 7.07 first pitch. Toronto is notorious for starting a few minutes late. So catch every pitch of the Nationals hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. And before we get into discussing Dylan Cruz and DJ Hers, DJ Hers, he's caught my attention. I can tell you that much. But before we get into that, Let me tell you guys about our friends over at Sleeper. And guys, do you think Kiber Ruiz can hit a home run tonight against the Toronto Blue Jays? Well, I sure do. And on Sleeper, you can swing for the fences with up to 100 time payouts. All you have to do is choose two or more players that you like and select more or less on their stat categories like home runs, strikeouts, hits, and more. Get your picks right and you could win big. Dynamic payouts are live. You may ask, what are dynamic payouts? But in short, each player projection now has a multiplier attached to it as opposed to preset multipliers based on the number of legs in a contest. With dynamic payouts also comes more stat categories to place contests on. You can get higher payouts than other apps with less picks. Use promo code Locked On and you'll get up to $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Make sure that you check out Sleeper today. Now we get back into it as we are going to highlight Dylan Cruz and DJ Hers. And for those who may not be too aware of who DJ Hers was, he was the main takeaway, the main uh, return, you could say, in that J-Mark Candelario trade. We got him from the Chicago Cubs and... Oh my God, has he been impressive. But first and foremost, let's talk about Dylan Cruz, the number one prospect in this organization. And Dylan Cruz, surprise, surprise, and I genuinely mean this, has struggled. This guy is human. I repeat, this guy is human. We didn't really expect this kind of struggle with Dylan Cruz, but I also feel like it was a nice little kind of slap in the face to remind us that this is not a rush process. Dylan Cruz is still a sure thing prospect. Dylan Cruz is still going to be a top five prospect in baseball. Dylan Cruz, in my mind, is still the number one outfielding prospect in all of baseball, in my opinion, over Jackson Chirios and all that fun stuff. Dylan Cruz is the number one outfield prospect in baseball. I'll say that again. He has struggled in double A. Now, here's the good news. It's only through six games. But I saw people kind of tweeting about this the other day and being like, well, I'm a little little shaky about this. Because at some point, Keith Law, someone who's very respected, very plugged into this, to prospects and all that stuff, quote in his story that he said that Dylan Cruz, this is his actual quote, I infer from the move that they're at least considering having him see the majors this year on Dylan Cruz just a few weeks ago after moving him up to double A. Well, at this moment in time, Dylan Cruz, I can tell you this, will not be in the major leagues. But two, he has struggled. He truly has struggled over his course in double A. The last week in six games at Harrisburg in 26 plate appearances, he only had three hits. He had a double and he had an RBI, two stolen bases. He was caught stealing twice. He walked three times and struck out four times as well. His slash line, 
was not pretty. A 143 batting average, a 269 OBP, and then a whopping 191, or sorry, 191 slug. That is a 460 OPS over six games. And only had four total bases in that time frame as well, compared to his 40 total bases that he had in 40 games down in Fredericksburg. No one should be overly concerned with Dylan Cruz. No one should be concerned at the slightest, in fact. But it is noteworthy that he is struggling. And really, it means nothing to me. It truly shows that this guy is a prospect just like the rest of them. There is never such thing. We throw this phrase around a lot. I do in particular. You cannot have a prospect that doesn't have the chance of missing. Every prospect in baseball. You look at Jackson Holiday. He had a tough first week down in double A as well. If you look at Jackson Holiday over the last few weeks here, he's been killing the baseball. He's the number one prospect in baseball. And in my opinion, it's not even close. Dylan Cruz is going to have his struggles over the course of a season. There's going to be an adjustment with him. Coming from LSU, getting up to low A on rookie ball, he started in one game, goes up to low A Fredericksburg, and then gets all the way bumped up to double A Harrisburg. You have all that pressure around you with James Wood, Brady House. You're with the rest of the top prospects in this organization. Really the marquee guys like Trey Lipscomb included, and as well as DJ Hers, Mitchell Parker, all these different guys. It's going to be a process for him. And I think this kind of struggle over the last few weeks has kind of just reminded us that let's play it cool. The struggle is early. I'm willing to bet as he gets back at it today, Tuesday, He's probably going to get a few hits in tonight's ball game. That's the kind of hitter that we expect with Dylan Cruz, and especially after getting the Monday off. It's absolutely what I expect is for him to bounce back and be even better. But speaking of someone who's bouncing back, if you remember DJ Hers, I know you know him. 2019 draftee by the Chicago Cubs at a high school, kind of a, an above slot guy. Some people who thought could be a very talented pitcher, and that's kind of what he's turned out to be. But what he has done over the last few starts here in Harrisburg have been nothing short of incredible. Over his last four starts, and first and foremost, let's talk about his first start ever with Harrisburg, as he got rocked around. And I mean rocked. I believe he gave up like five-plus earned runs, walked a handful of batters, only struck out a few as well. It was not good. But ever since then, over his last 18 and two-thirds innings pitch with Harrisburg, that's four starts, he's only given up five hits. He's walked eight batters. He's hit two batters. He's got 27 strikeouts in those 18 and two-thirds innings pitch. He's got a 0 0.96 ERA. Batters are batting 882, 0 82 against him. And they have a 326 OPS in that frame as well. And this is the crazy thing. He's doing all these numbers while also walking eight batters over those 18 and two-thirds innings pitch. That is a lot of walks to consider, and as well as the two hit hit batters. DJ Hers, while, again, this is a young prospect. This is still a young kid, 21 years old, really fresh, really kind of new, because last year he was really good in, uh, in high A. But as he got put up in double A, he saw that slider competition, and it wasn't all that friendly to him. As you can see, he had an 8-2-4 ERA in AA last year over nine starts. Not good. And even then, that was in 31 innings he had that. So it wasn't just a little bit of a workload. He had a decent amount there. But I think with DJ Hers, I think it's safe to say that Mike Rizzo found himself something. Because this guy, the 27 strikeouts, I can't get over. That's something I just cannot unsee. 27 strikeouts over 18 and two-thirds inning. This is something that this guy has done over the course of his career. He has been able to prove that he's got elite stuff. And his changeup, as a lot of people have touted as one of the best, if not the best, in all of minor leagues, I think he's also proven that as well in double-A. And he's starting to have his stuff click just a little bit more because this year was really not all that easy for him. Back when he was in, in Chicago, or not in Tennessee, in the Chicago Cubs system, he was good. He had a 3.97 ERA in 14 starts this year. 59 innings pitched. He had 80 strikeouts as well. But so far, I mean, what he has proven us here in Washington, D.C. has been just very good. 
this guy has legit upside to be either a good starter, in my opinion, if he can fix this really, he has really bad command, simple and straight, really bad command overall. But if he can find a way to kind of pull those things together and really just get down in the lab and work on these different issues that he has had, we're going to have something with DJ Hurts. And I'm going to kind of claim him and put my flag in the ground. I'm a DJ Hurts guy just because I see these lofty strikeout numbers and it doesn't really matter what level you're at. If you are generating that many outs on your own, that's really good, especially when you only give up 0.4 home runs per nine innings in Harrisburg as well. He's having elite numbers, and overall this year it's a 0.6 per nine. But that walk rate is what has been killer. It's better than last year when he was walking 6.6 batters per inning, per nine innings rather. This year, it's 5.3 batters per nine innings. So what he has to work on, he's not really giving up hits. As we only said, he had a few hits over his last few starts. It's the walking. It's his own damage being done. He's got good fielding behind him. He's got good defense overall. It's just kind of been himself and what he has done. Because when you have 12 and a half strikeouts per nine innings, you got my attention. DJ Hers has absolutely has my attention at this moment in time. And I think it's safe to say that we could count on this guy even going into next year in 2023. He'll probably start the year off in AAA Rochester. And at that moment in time, the next call up will be up to the Washington Nationals. Well, the big question there will be, is he going to be a bullpen guy or is he going to be a starter at first? That's something that we could talk about another day, but it's certainly an offseason topic that I want to get into. Thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen. And of course, the Nationals play the Blue Jays tonight at 7.07 Eastern Time. You can catch every pitch of the Nationals' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. And, of course, today you're going up against the Blue Jays up in Toronto in the six, as Drake would say. Are we going to lose three games in a row? Because I'm going to be honest, I'm not used to this losing thing with this second-half national scrappy Nats team, whatever you want to call them. I'm not used to this. We'll preview that game just after this. And welcome back into Locked On Nationals as we preview today's game, the Toronto Blue Jays, and as well as your Washington Nationals. And of course, it's a good day. You may ask why. It's a Mackenzie Gore day. Mackenzie Gore going on the bump tonight in Toronto at the Rogers Center. And oh, by the way, I don't know if you guys followed Andrew Golden over on Twitter. If you don't, you probably should. Covers the Nationals over on the Washington Post. Check out the upgrades at the Rogers Center as man. I know this is just kind of like a weird, random thing out of nowhere, but I love baseball stadiums. I'm a baseball stadium mark. I follow all the history of stadiums. It's my weird thing. I love ballparks. The Rogers Center is certainly up there as to one that I want to go to. They have a hotel in center field, as everyone knows at this point, but also it just looks cool. You saw the little Toronto needle up in the background of that photo as yesterday the dome was open. And it was just such a cool ballpark to see. And the improvements that they have made there, gorgeous. It looks incredible compared to what it once used to be. It just looked like an old crappy stadium. But they have done a great job rejuvenating that place. And when the Toronto Blue Jays are in the playoffs, the fans show up. That is a loud and a hard place to play. And it's a hard place to pitch at as well. So going into tonight... Mackenzie Gore, again, it's going to be a tough, tough time. When you have Vladdy Jr. in that lineup, when you have Bo Bichette, when you have Davis Schneider, the third baseman that has ripped the cover off the baseball over his first month in baseball, in pro baseball at least, there is some concern with this. And again, it's as simple as this. Mackenzie Gore has struggled against right-handed bats all year long. He has. It's pretty normal for guys, and really over the last few starts in particular. That's not really a concerning part of it for me when it comes to Gore. But when you look at the power guys that the Blue Jays have in that ballpark where they seem to have just have the ball fly whenever and wherever they want, that's going to be a little bit of a concerning part with this Nationals team. But here's the good thing with Mackenzie Gore. He's kind of starting to come into his own. Now, while he's also had struggles over the second half of the season, he still has proven to me that Mackenzie Gore, I can trust him. I can go into any start 
knowing that we're going to get one, his best effort, and two, I feel pretty safe against him going up against really any team. But the obvious standouts for me are those right-handed bats in that lineup, especially for the Blue Jays. They have a ton of them, and they always come at you. It's going to be a tough game, but the Nationals are also going up against a right-handed pitcher with Jose Barrios. If you remember, one of the main trade deadline candidates back in 2021 was also shipped off. His value got declined just a little bit because of the Nationals trading away Max Scherzer, but Jose Barrios was a very legit pitcher for the Minnesota Twins, was then shipped up to Toronto. Last year, he was god-awful. This year, he's been their second-best pitcher behind Kevin Gosman, who we saw yesterday. It's going to be a tough game, but then you look at some of these bats. You have Kibert Ruiz batting from the left side of the plate, which, by the way, before this season, I always liked Kibert Ruiz from the right side of the plate. I just saw his mechanics were just a little bit better, from my opinion there. How wrong am I? Kibar Ruiz from the left side of the plate, that is what we want to see more. So this matchup, I look at him. I look at C.J. Abrams in the lefty bat like a Dominic Smith. I like those matchups for him. So while the Blue Jays, they have their good matchups going up against Gore, we also have ours going up against Jose Barrios. So it's going to be a fun game. I think this could be a high-scoring affair depending on just what happens. C.J. Abrams coming off a really good game yesterday. Maybe he can build off on that again, cause some chaos in the base path, and really just do his thing. And also Mackenzie Gore, you never know when this guy will just click and he will look like your future ace of your Washington Nationals. And thank you all for making Locked On Nats your first listen every day. Of course, the Nationals play the Blue Jays tonight at 7.07 Eastern time. It's Mackenzie Gore versus Jose Barrios. It'll be a fun one. Catch every pitch of the Nationals hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Nationals there. And of course, on tomorrow's show, we will have to break down Mackenzie Gore's start. Please, will he bounce back? Will this Nationals team bounce back after kind of a dud game yesterday? Because here's the thing. Us Nationals fans, we're getting a little spoiled with this winning thing. We're getting used to it. I kind of like the feeling of walking around my team in the playoff race, you could say, technically. I like that feeling. I like being a little bit better than the New York Mets. I like having the same record as San Diego Padres. Let's keep it that way. Let's not win or let's not lose three straight ball games because this Nationals team, this Scrappy Nats team, they don't lose. I'll catch you on the flip side.